Good morning and welcome to the University of Maryland School of Public Policy commencement exercises for 2018. Woo. <laughs> When you're dean, you learn to take a cue from your students. I'm Robert Orr, dean of the Maryland School of Public Policy, and I am delighted to share the excitement of this day with friends, family, and of course, our graduates. Today is a celebration of our amazing students gathered here, graduates and our first trailblazing class of undergraduates. This is also a celebration of public service. There is no higher calling, no more noble endeavor. We are very excited about the challenges, the opportunities, and the success that we know lie ahead for our graduates. You will quite literally change the world for the better. No pressure. That is not to say that it will come easy. You enter a world and a field that is quite different from the one when you step through our doors for the first time. The world is on fire in many ways. There are more refugees and displaced persons in the world today than at any time in recorded human history. Nationalism is an increasing force in global politics and populism has come to power in various countries with devastating consequences. Here, in this country, we are suffering through a period of radical doubt about our institutions, our leaders, even our values. Inequality is at historic highs and growing. Race, always a powerful force in American society, is wielded in 2018 as a weapon against those perceived as different. Black and brown lives matter, but not enough. We are polarized as never before, with words like bipartisan and even cooperation being used by some as an epithet. The term civic virtue sounds quaint, outdated. If this is a sobering reality to begin a commencement ceremony with, it is. But against this, we have many people, especially those here in this room, who do not accept this reality, who expect better. We have public servants, bridge builders, ethical and humble people, innovators, bold thinkers, collaborators, and believers who see that the world can, what the world can and should be, and who are working relentlessly toward a better world. All my colleagues here with me on the stage will confirm that it is true that professors learn from their students. We are also inspired by you. Your determination, your faith in the future and each other, and your immense capacity to change the world for the better has inspired us. And it has inspired me to believe in the prospect of a brighter future. That, my friends, is power, and for that, we thank you. Two years ago, on your watch and with your help, we made the University of Maryland the country's first do-good campus, and you here in this school have been the driving force. You are the epitome of students who not only do well, but also do good. And you have done so in our neighborhood, in Prince George's County, in the great state of Maryland, in Washington, D.C., and all over the world. You are not waiting to make a difference. You already have, and you continue to do so. As your dean, I could not be prouder. At the same time, I am humbled by the leadership you have demonstrated in these challenging times. Graduates, all this pomp and circumstance is for you. You have earned this, but it's also for your families, your friends, your loved ones. They too have worked hard and sacrificed a lot for this day, 
So please stand and give them a round of applause. <laughs> Yesterday at the campus-wide ceremony, there were a group of golden terps from the class of 1968. That was a devastating year where we lost the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Robert F. Kennedy, and much of our national innocence and many of our national illusions. Our cities literally were on fire with Washington, D.C. being first among them. Fifty years ago today, our nation's capital was literally on fire. As President Lowe described yesterday how the world was on fire back then, I watched the heads of the Golden Terps as they nodded. They remember 1968 as if it were yesterday. Yet they persevered, and that generation made sure the world that they helped to create was the better for it. Good policy and indeed life is often about taking the long view. Envision what the world can and should look like when you come back here as Golden Policy Terps in 2068. Now, some of us may not be here to welcome you back, <laughs> but I hope that my successor, many times removed, will welcome you back as Golden Policy Terps and you will be able to reflect on what you have done to make the world a much better place in those 50 years. We need you to be the drivers of change, and from everything we've seen, you will indeed be that. Every year, the students select classmates to make a few remarks. This year's graduate students have selected Mr. Theodore Carruthers. It's really hard to tell why they selected him. Mr. Carruthers graduates today with a Master's of Public Policy with a specialization in international security and economic policy. During that time, he served as the Vice President of the Black Students in Public Policy Student Group and as a teaching assistant for two of the school's foundational undergraduate policy courses. Previously, he earned BAs in International Studies and French from Morehouse College. Mr. Carruthers proudly cites his parents and two older brothers as positive role models who shaped him in his formative years. Mr. Carruthers, the floor is yours. Greetings, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any good jokes for you all today, so we'll just go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dean Nor, not only for the kind words and the support and the friendship, but for this wonderful tie that uh, it's got Maryland pride. I'd like to acknowledge the distinguished guests, deans, staff, faculty, family members, and friends who traveled great lengths to be here today. I'd be remiss if I didn't give special acknowledgement to a few people here today, but before going forward, <clears throat> I'm reminded of a phrase that I've often heard throughout my life, that if it had not been for the Lord, where would I be? And I'd like to take time to thank God for allowing me not only to see the end of this program, but to see the program with you all. I understand that I too could have been another Richard Collins who did nothing wrong but was slain because of hate and the color of his skin. So I'm grateful that God allowed me to see the end of this program with you all. <laughs> uh, to my amazingly supportive family and friends who traveled far and wide to be here, thank you for everything that you provided me. Words cannot express how much it means to me to see you all here today. To the faculty and staff who let me bother them to no end, <laughs> the entire second and third floor, <laughs> and my family in the undergraduate department, thank you for always welcoming me and challenging me to further myself. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank my wonderful, beautiful, intelligent, supportive girlfriend and fellow graduate, Taryn Levels. I'm glad grad school brought us together even all the way from California. <laughs> And to you, my fellow graduates, thank you for allowing me the honor to share some final thoughts with you all, as well as accompanying you through this journey through 688Y and teaching baseball, uh, reading Evicted with Professor Duke, 
and arguably our favorite bonding experience of Project Course. I'm proud to call all of you friends, and I have no doubt in my mind that in the end, we will change the world for the better, whether that's in Baltimore, PG County, DC, Howard County, or even Haiti. In reflecting on what I should tell you all today, I settled on a reminder, a reminder of what encouraged us to pursue this life-changing field called public policy. We all enrolled in this program because we had aspirations of responding to public problems in their various forms, whether that takes the form of good governance, a lack of affordable housing, or environmental policy more broadly. Each of these issues require a policymaker who pursues and enacts good and effective policy. These issues require a policymaker who actively seeks opportunities to do good in their community, and a policymaker with a multifaceted approach to problem solving for government at each and every level. I'm here to remind you all that you are that policymaker. I'm here to remind you all that your greatest contribution to society has yet to manifest itself. Our greatest contribution as policymakers won't be the many problems we've solved, nor will it be the awards accrued over our careers. Our greatest contribution won't be seeing the amazing advancements we've pioneered in our respective fields, nor will it be the correction of social injustices that have plagued minority and marginalized communities for decades. Our greatest contribution as policymakers will be that when others heard no, we heard find another way. Because policymakers are in the business of helping people, and without people, we're pointless. Each of us have had our struggles as policy students, but those struggles have only brought us closer. Whether struggling through 610, taking 611, <laughs> or finding that perfect internship while getting a master's degree. I'm here to remind you all that you did it. In spite of trials, rejection letters, and those employers that didn't get back to us even though we applied, you did it. We've all found comfort in different ways being in this program. Some of us dropped by Trisha's office for some positivity. Some of us befriended the deans. For some of us, happy hour became quite too common. And um, for others, seeing Professor Duke was all we needed to feel better. As I close, I want to leave you all with three final thoughts. One, never forget the value of community and being a change agent, a change agent for inclusive policies at all levels of government. Understand that hard work is necessary and remain a fervent advocate for issues encompassing well-being for all. Two, remember that there's no one-size-fits-all approach to policymaking. We all have unique perspective and defining experiences. And finally, when you enter into the world after leaving SPP, remember what lured you into this field. Remember your why and remember to be patient because there will come a time where someone will depend on you to become a change agent. Congratulations to all the class of 2018. I wanted to just let that applause soak in. Thank you, Mr. Carruthers, Theo, for your eloquent, witty, and thought-provoking remarks. This year's graduation ceremony marks not only a milestone for all of our graduates, but also for the school. We recently introduced our first undergraduate major, and today we celebrate our very first Bachelor of Arts in Public Policy graduates. See, you blend in so well, I can't even find you in the crowd. Where are you? Hands up, right there, good. This year's graduation ceremony marks not only a milestone for all of our graduates, but also for the school. We recently introduced our first undergraduate major, and today we celebrate our very first Bachelor of Arts in Public Policy graduates. See, you blend in so well, I can't even find you in the crowd. Where are you? Hands up, right there, good. I want to personally congratulate, congratulate you and thank you for being those trailblazers. There will be many who come after you. Uh, we couldn't be prouder of our first group of graduates as uh, of, uh, Bachelor of Arts in Public Policy graduates. This year's BA and Public Policy students have selected Mr. Mari Lemmy to re represent them in today's ceremony. <laughs> Mr. Lemmy hails from Baltimore, Maryland. 
he first began studying social change as part of the Justice and Legal Thought Scholars program. He then participated in the Rawlings Undergraduate Leadership Fellows Program and became one of our first students to join the inaugural class of public policy undergraduate majors. He served as a new student orientation advisor and ambassador for both scholars and the School of Public Policy and as a member of the social entrepreneur group in Ecuador. That's the country, Ecuador. Mr. Lemmy plans to use his policy education and his passion for storytelling to raise consciousness through film and television. Mr. Lemmy, the floor is yours. Good afternoon and congratulations to the graduates and to everyone who helped us get here. I feel incredibly honored to have the opportunity to speak on behalf of the first undergraduate cohort of public policy. I'm going to take the next few minutes to reflect on the experience and to articulate some of the lessons that we learned throughout the journey. One of the staples of my undergraduate career was telling people my major, watching them nod with a look of intrigue and, intrigue and slight confusion, and then having to explain the difference between public policy and related fields. Which isn't super surprising. I couldn't have provided a solid definition of public policy until a few years ago. And it's still not the simplest thing to do, but I have gotten better at it with practice. So first. There is quite a bit of overlap with other subjects, but what separates policy is the connections that we make. In an effort to find solutions to our society's most persistent problems, we study principles related to government and economics, we look at different types of philosophy, we collect and analyze data, we think about what's behind human behavior, and we seek to understand cultural perspectives. That's a lot, and it's all necessary. Because ignoring the human component and just thinking of people as statistics doesn't help the ones who are never really given a chance. And while contextualizing problems is very important, there are millions of people currently hurting, and they need solutions. In addition to making these connections, we were taught to acknowledge counterarguments, to think about the feasibility of our proposed solutions, to write concisely and persuasively, to recognize credible sources and cite them, all of which is necessary for effective policy analysis, but these things are also important life skills, especially right now. But what's most important, I think, is that we learn to engage in informed and honest dialogue. And we created a space where people could speak and ask questions without being judged. We learned that resisting the natural urge to avoid topics that make us uncomfortable is precise precisely what's needed, to grow and to be sure that we aren't unknowingly standing in the way of progress. I still randomly think about some of the things that my classmates said. Sometimes it was new information that broadened my perspective, and other times I was just impressed by the clarity with which someone articulated a familiar feeling or idea. Either way, a lot stayed with me. Esther was still talking about the Puerto Rico recovery effort long after the news coverage had stopped. If I'd been getting all of my information from cable news, I might have assumed everything was fine now. My biggest takeaway from this experience is that there's absolutely nothing like talking to someone who's actually impacted by an issue. Hearing young women talk about all the things they go through on a day-to-day -day basis was also eye-opening for me. Some people are scared of what's going to happen when strong women bring awareness to reality. That's especially evident right now. One of the things I feel most fortunate about is that I've been surrounded by strong women throughout this journey because now I'm even more certain that rooms full of old men shouldn't be regulating women's bodies and that violence against women wouldn't be nearly as prevalent if men held each other accountable. Our classes force us to think about why we believe the things we do and to learn about the experiences that shape the views of others. Maybe places like the Thanksgiving table should continue to be politics-free zones, but we do need to carve out some time to talk about what's going on. Because policy has real implications, and if we aren't thinking about them, it's likely that at least some people will end up suffering. It's then a matter of who gets hurt and how much we as a society care about those people. When my classmates and I talked about the issues, we weren't saying, oh, well, they're just like that, or they're crazy or stupid or overly sensitive. Those statements are cop-outs. They're intellectually lazy and counterproductive. Each one of us knows that there is no they, there's only us. We learn the importance of recognizing and appreciating the humanity of whomever we're engaging with, even if we disagree. We studied the atrocities that have occurred throughout the course of history, not to point fingers or to make anyone feel bad about things that happened before they were born, but so that we could understand the harm that's been caused by mental shortcuts and apathy, and so that we can see once and for all that has always been empathy, understanding, and compassion that's moved us forward. We looked at people that changed the world for the better, not to put them on a pedestal or use their quotes every once in a while, and certainly not as an excuse to pretend that the issues they were fighting for have been entirely solved. We understand that they were 
passionate, talented, flawed human beings, quite a bit like ourselves, who, didn't, who decided they didn't like what they were seeing in the world. There's religious diversity within our group, but I think we all have similar beliefs about why we're here. It's not to run from difficult or uncomfortable situations. It's not to posture and try to seem more impressive than the people around us. It's not to make money at the expense of others. It's to figure out how our unique talents and abilities can be best used to positively impact our surroundings. Some might call this cliche, but it's love that gets us there. People were kept separate to discourage the sharing of ideas. So each time we came together to discuss past and current events or even just life experience, we honored everyone that made this possible. It's a shame that caring about problems of another group puts a person at risk of being ostracized from their own. But in the space that we worked to create, we were all each other's allies. And on a less esoteric note, this program provided us with a place to fully nerd out and talk about things like renewable energy and restorative justice. It's a beautiful thing. Whether we were venting about our dissatisfaction with the current state of the world, or respectfully disagreeing about solutions, or collectively regretting putting off assignments, we were benefiting from the little bit of light that we created for ourselves in what seemed like a pretty dark time. An underappreciated part of the change-making progress is allocating some time for joy. We did that by showing each other pictures of our pets, by going out, by sharing funny stories. One of my biggest regrets is that we didn't make the group chat earlier, because it's things like that that make life a little less hard. Though we've all become somewhat desensitized to violence, the compassionate among us never really get used to waking up to news notifications about atrocities that could be entirely avoided if more lawmakers were willing to use common sense. Sometimes we felt like we were stuck on the sidelines at a pivotal point in history. Personally, I'm not sure how I would have dealt with the frustration had I, had not, have I, had I not had this sort of support system. Recently, there's been a lot of talk about the audacity of this younger generation. Perhaps certain criticisms are valid, though I'm confident we'll work through the kinks in time. But what deserves to be celebrated is that many of us have reached a consensus that all people are actually equal. We're using new technologies to learn about each other, and we're ready to face history head on. We're envisioning a better future for all of us. A time when selfless educators are actually provided with the tools they need to shape our youth, and no one is at risk of being harmed while merely trying to exist in a public space. A time when we prioritize our planet and its inhabitants over profit, and where we all take a, scan, a stand against problems that will never touch us. It's important to know that there is always opposition to the truth, to know that some people who benefit from the current status quo will question our motives, and to know that we're all part of a bigger plan. I'll begin to wrap this up with a lesson that Dr. Harris taught me in regards to my own life, but that also applies here. There's no going back. This is all part of the story now. So what are we going to do next? I don't have all the answers. More than anything, this experience has taught us how to go about finding them. I know that it involves listening, reading, thinking out loud, questioning what we think we know, unlearning, remaining patient while rejecting complacency, and communicating our findings as clearly, deliberately, and kindly as possible. I know that the divisiveness and the nastiness that we're seeing right now is temporary because we're all committed to doing that. So this was preseason, boot camp, practice, whatever you want to call it. If we weren't ready, we wouldn't be here right now. So really, it's just a matter of time. I want to take this opportunity to say thank you for allowing me to remain optimistic. Better days are coming, and I look forward to getting there with all of you. Congratulations again. Soak it up, Mari. I think you're going to have a few occasions in your life for uh, long applauses. I want to thank you for those inspiring remarks. And a few minutes ago, I said professors learn from their students. Let me just say, there is no they. There is only us, to quote a very famous undergraduate graduate. Many of our graduates have been the recipients of special awards or honors. They have distinguished themselves during their tenure at the school as public leaders, activists, scholars. Professor Crocker will now honor several of the awardees. Professor Crocker has served as a senior research scholar in the School of Public Policy since 1993. He specializes in international development, ethics, socio-political philosophy, transitional justice, and democracy. And he has served as the school's head of international development programs for many years. Professor Crocker. Latin honors are among the highest honors given to undergraduate students upon graduation. <clears throat> 
This year, the School of Public Policy's Latin Honors were established by an average GPA ranges from across all colleges at the university. The benchmark for this year was 3.846. We are delighted to recognize our own Catherine Posco as receiving cum laude honors this year. Please stand, Ms. Posco. Congratulations. Next, we honor the graduates who have been inducted into Pi Alpha Alpha National Honor Society. The Pi Alpha Alpha National Honor Society encourages and recognizes outstanding scholarship and accomplishment in public policy and administration education, as well as integrity, professionalism, and effective performance in the conduct of government and related public service. Only students and graduates meeting the highest academic standards are invited to Pi Alpha Alpha. I am delighted to recognize the students from this year's School of Public Policy graduating classes who have been so honored. When I read your name, please stand up and remain standing until each name has been announced. Please hold your applause until then. The PAA Honor Society inductees among this year's graduates are Stephanie Arzaga, Leon Byrne, Christine Bogan, William Creedon, Maria Victoria Corsa, Isaac Muneni and Dereva. Congratulations. Let's applause these students. The Presidential Management Fellows Program was established by executive order in 1977 to attract to the federal, to federal service outstanding individuals from a wide variety of academic disciplines who are particularly skilled in the analysis and in management of public policies and programs. Fellows are selected through a highly competitive national process. The extraordinary nature of the students who come to the School of Public Policy is reflected in the fact of this year's Presidential Management Fellows class boasts two Presidential Management Fellows. This year's Presidential Management Fellows are Aaron Burr and William Creedon. Congratulations. I think they should stand up. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's commencement speaker, Mr. Roger W. Ferguson, Jr. Born and raised in Washington, D.C., Mr. Ferguson has left his mark on the world, the whole world. He is the ultimate Renaissance man, having served at the highest levels of government, business and finance, and the nonprofit sector. As the President and Chief Executive Officer of TIAA, one of the world's largest and most successful financial services firms, Mr. Ferguson has secured the, retirement, excuse me, secured the retirements of countless employees who have served the public good. As Vice Chairman of the Board of Governors of the U.S. Federal Reserve System, among other things, he led efforts to secure our financial system in the wake of the attacks of 9-11. And he has shown us what good governance looks like as in a member of the Board of Global Pi uh, excuse me, as a member of the Board of Global Private Entities such as General Mills and Alphabet, the parent company of Google, and major nonprofits such as the Smithsonian Institution, just to name a few. He has loudly and proudly advocated for diversity and inclusion on all boards and across the corporate workforce as a business imperative. And closer to home, for us here at SPP, 
He has actively supported our Do Good initiative and our students. In short, Mr. Ferguson embodies what we want our graduates to be. He is a successful leader, full of fearless ideas, who has not only done well, but also done good in every sphere for all. Mr. Ferguson, the floor is yours. Dean Orr, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, if my mother were here, she'd be proud. Uh, my wife would be pleased, and my kids would be scratching their heads. <laughs> More seriously, Dean Orr again, distinguished faculty, honored guests, members of the class of 2018, families and friends, I am truly delighted to join you today. And again, congratulations to the class of 2018. You did it, way to go. As the Dean has already indicated, you deserve all the pomp and circumstance of this happy day. And as he also indicated, it's important to give a special shout out and congratulations to all the parents, family, and friends in the audience for all the support, emotional, financial, and otherwise, that you've given to the class of 2018 in their journey to this moment. I thought I heard some applause for that as well. And finally, congratulations to the Dean and the School of Public Policy for graduating this fine class, which includes your first class of undergraduate public policy majors. Way to go in the back. Thank you for that. This is yet another important milestone in the distinguished history of the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. So class of 2018, my job today is to offer up some so-called words of wisdom to help you navigate the journey ahead. And when I thought about what I wanted to share with you today, I kept coming back to one piece of advice above all others. All others. It's fairly simple, but I think it's a powerful guide to happiness in your life and in your career. It has certainly helped me to influence my career, especially in the times in which we are now living. And my advice to you is this. Be satisfied, but not self-satisfied. So let me explain what I mean by that. Being satisfied is being proud of yourselves, pleased with your achievements as you have the right to be pleased with them today. Being satisfied will keep you moving forward, give you a sense of purpose, and allow you to be a difference maker, a change maker, a contributor to the world around you. But being self-satisfied is a different story entirely. It's about being too proud and about being pleased with yourself. It's smugness, complacency, being full of yourself. In today's world, our culture often seems to celebrate the self-satisfied. We tend to glorify people who readily tout their achievements, their fame, their fortune, whose sentences often begin with the word I, as if those were the most important determinants of a good life. In my opinion, that's regrettable, because self-satisfaction has a corrosive quality. For the individuals who display it, but also for the organizations they work in, and ultimately for the society as a whole. So let me share with you three reasons why self-satisfaction can take you off track to having a fulfilling career, and most importantly, a happy life. First, self-satisfaction will make you complacent. When you're self-satisfied, you're feeling pretty fabulous about yourself and your achievements. And you know what, you're thinking there's not much more you can do. But complacency is never a good thing. So let me share a story from my own journey when complacently tripped me up. My second job was working in the New York offices of McKinsey and Company, the consulting firm. I was one of McKinsey's first hires, maybe its very first, who didn't have an MBA. At first, they rejected me. Indeed, they just sent me a form letter saying, no, we're not interested. But I didn't give up. A friend of mine helped me get an interview, and I eventually landed a position as an associate. I did reasonably well in my role, and after six or seven years, I thought I was close to being named a partner. I was feeling very good about the work I had done and the contributions that Roger had made. In fact, I was feeling so good that I let a bit of complacency slip in. So when in one of my last studies before the important partnership vote came up, the team had to do some economic modeling for an acquisition that one of our big clients was considering. And to be honest with you, in this room, I got a little sloppy. I asked a junior associate to do the work and to pull together some slides for me. But I wasn't thorough enough in my guidance, and we handed his work. I didn't double check it. 
to be very clear, and don't tell anyone else about this, I failed in the quality control that was an important part of my responsibility as a senior associate. So the day of the big presentation arrives, we gathered around one of those big corporate tables, a group of high-powered corporate types on one side, uh, the McKinsey team on the other, the people who had all the answers and were charged a small fortune to share them. When we got to my slides in the economic modeling, it was immediately clear to everyone in the room that the numbers were just flat out wrong. At that point, all the air went out of the room, which only made it easier to see the steam coming out of the ears of the senior partner. That's a picture you never want to experience, and it's one I'll never forget. So I did take responsibility for my mistake. The senior partner thanked me for being bold and stepping forward and made it clear that I was never going to be a firm, a partner in the firm, if it had to do with him. So I thought my career was done. But my wonderful wife gave me what a wonderful wife always does. She gave me a swift kick in the pants. <laughs> she told me to stop moaning and groaning, get back in there, give it another shot, just like I had when McKinsey had originally rejected me with a form letter. So after some searching, I was able to find a partner in another office who agreed to give me a second chance, but doing a very different role for the firm, overseeing our research and knowledge management activities. Although I thought I deserved to be a partner at this great firm, and I truly loved McKinsey, I was never so sure that I was ever going to be promoted after the big mistake. Nevertheless, I took on the new role, did my best to make a difference in the world. I traveled around the globe for the firm, proposed some new models, and eventually did become a partner. And I came away from that experience with a, very, with a few very valuable lessons. The first, which is obvious, is that complacency is a dangerous thing. Second, I learned something very important. Success is never final, but failure is never fatal. You can overcome your mistakes if you have the resilience and the determination to do so. And last, but certainly not least, I learned the importance of marrying a woman who would give you a swift kick in the pants. <laughs> it was my wife who convinced me to not give up. She is one of the most resilient and quick-thinking people I know. She tells a great story about overcoming mistakes that I will share with you today because I think it will particularly resonate with a group of public policy graduates. My wife spent 10 years in public service at the Securities and Exchange Commission when I was at the Federal Reserve, including three as an SEC commissioner. At one point, she was at the World Economic Forum in Davos, where the great and the good meet to pat themselves on the back. And at one of those dinners, she found herself seated next to a very important-looking man that she didn't recognize. Endeavoring to make conversation, she asked him what he did for a living. And he responded very proudly. He said, I am the president of Slovenia. My wife was a bit embarrassed, not knowing that. As she said, she should have read The Economist. But she rallied quickly with another question. She said, excellent. And what did you do before you were the president of Slovenia? He responded, I was the president of Yugoslavia. <laughs> At this point, my wife was sheepish, but she did not fall apart. She looked him right in the eye, she smiled, and she said, your mother must be very proud. <laughs> He smiled back, the ice was broken, and from that point on, they had a delightful dinner conversation. So remember, mistakes are rarely fatal. Own them, you'll become stronger and more resilient. The second point I want to make about self-satisfaction is that it will warp your attitude toward your job. If you want to be successful, attitude is everything. Not attitude, but the right attitude. You must come to work ready to do your best at whatever job you may have. I credit my parents for teaching me that no job is ever too small to do well. They had a clear expectation that whatever you did, whatever I did, whatever anyone did, do it well the first time or you do it over again. I didn't see their wisdom when I was a teenager refolding the laundry because I had rushed through it the first time around, but I certainly came to appreciate it as I got older. My work study job for the first two years in college was cleaning dorm bathrooms, two hours a day, Monday through Friday, 10 hours a week, cleaning the bathrooms of other Harvard freshmen. Not the most glamorous or sought after job, as you might imagine. But I was determined to do it well. And in fact, I did so well that my federal students actually took time to write a letter to thank me. I'm still proud of that. But more to the point, the experience worked a muscle, not this muscle, but a muscle up here that I call the no job is too small muscle. 
You have to do that again and again. You have to work that muscle up here that reminds you that no job is too small to do well. When you're self-satisfied, you're tempted to see certain jobs and tasks as beneath your dignity. After all, you have graduated from the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. Instead of focusing on doing your best job, you focus on moving to a bigger and better job, and the risk is that your work suffers. You have to earn the opportunity to advance, and you do that by performing with excellence no matter the task, small or large. As I mentioned, attitude is so important. You'll be happiest, I believe, when you adopt an attitude that prizes lifelong learning, and when you approach your work itself as a learning opportunity. That was my experience at the beginning of the Fed. I had not been a monetary policy economist, so I spent literally the first year more than that, actually, asking tons of questions. Had the team come and brief me on all the data. I took on many of the committee assignments, many of which were not considered high profile. But in each one of these cases, there was a chance to learn something about the system or the economy, which in turn made me better able to contribute in meaningful ways, all of which came together on that fateful day in 9-11. So after all, that's what it's all about, continuing to learn so that you can contribute when you're called upon. This brings me to my third and final point that I want to make about self-satisfaction. Self-satisfaction will keep you narrowly focused on you. A good life is not defined by your own success alone. To be truly happy, you must look outward as well, with gratitude for what you have, with appreciation for the people in your life, and with a commitment to give back to your community and the world. There's a Chinese saying about the road to happiness. It goes like this. If you want a happiness for an hour, take a nap. If you want happiness for a day, go fishing. If you want happiness for a month, get married. If you want happiness for a year, inherit a fortune. If you want happiness for a lifetime, help somebody. Now, you chuckled at the get married, and I agree with you, obviously. If you want happy for a lifetime, get married <laughs> and help somebody. And that is obvious that lasting happiness comes from focusing on others. Winston Churchill put it this way, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Here in the 21st century, science has given us the data to back up what great thinkers have said throughout time. Studies now show that there's a clear link between well-being and things like giving back, having a purpose in life, and performing acts of generosity. I am fortunate, as you heard, to work for a company that for 100 years has been saving, have been serving people whose life work is giving back and making a difference in the world. We help people like the faculty and staff here to pursue financial well-being in life and in retirement so they can devote their lives to educating people such as you. My work is immensely satisfying because of the kinds of people and the institutions that TIA serves. In your life and career, don't think only about yourself and what the world can give to you. Think also about others and what you can do to make the world a better place. I know that kind of mindset comes naturally to all of you. You would not have chosen the public policy path if you didn't already have a keen sense of the world around you and a desire to make it better. And even more than that, you chose a university that is a global leader in advancing social change and inspiring students such as yourselves to address the greatest challenges of the time. You made a wise choice in coming to the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. You have received a great education, and you now have the tools you need to succeed. You have the intelligence, you have the drive, you have the determination to make a difference. I hope you'll use all of that to be a change maker in our world, a change maker who is satisfied with your achievements, but never satisfied with yourselves. With that, let me close again my offer my congratulations to each one of you. Your achievement is a tribute to your talents, your ambitions, to those of your family and friends, to the faculty and staff here at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. So if you remember nothing else, remember this, your mother must be very proud. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roger, for your wisdom but even more for continuing to serve as a role model, not just for our graduates today, but for all of us. Thank you.
And now the moment we've all been waiting for, <laughs> graduation. We'll begin with the students who will be receiving the university's highest degree, the Doctorate of Philosophy. To introduce our PhD graduates, let me introduce the director of our doctoral program, Professor Robert Sprinkle. Professor Sprinkle holds two doctorate degrees, because one just isn't good enough. <laughs> a PhD from Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs, and an MD from the University of Cincinnati. He specializes in clinical medicine, bioethics, health policy, bioengineering, environmental policy, political theory, and biosecurity. Professor Sprinkle. Uh, thank you very much. As the dean said, the uh, PhD degree, the Doctor of Philosophy degree is the highest degree um, earned at this university. Now, some of you out there may have one from here or elsewhere. Others of you um, may be wondering if you should get one. Uh, if you're in that latter group, um, you know, by way of full disclosure, I should tell you what you would be in for. Um, and uh, it, it's a little uh, sobering. Uh, if, if you wanted to get one of ours from the School of Public Policy, you'd first have to get accepted. Our acceptance rate at the moment is about 8%. Uh, now, seven. Um, uh, most of our applicants, uh, this is, isn't required, but most of them enter with a master's degree already earned. Some have two. Uh, we're likely to take one next year with three. I, I, I can't, don't ask me to explain. Um, you'd have to do coursework uh, and collaborative research uh, with your advisor simultaneously for about two years. You'd have to pass five qualifying examinations. You'd then have to assemble a dissertation committee of professors who are so impressed with you that they want to join your research project they would have to accept the proposal. You'd have to assist with teaching as the opportunity would, might arise. And then you'd have to write and defend a dissertation in public. Uh, now, the dissertation itself. Uh, I, I used to do a seminar on the dissertation as a scholarly form. All we read were dissertations, other people's dissertations. We, always spent a lot of time on the dedications and the acknowledgments. Um, in the dedications and acknowledgments, you get the impression that writing a dissertation is traumatic, uh, it's gratifying, and it's transformative. Uh, people thank their parents and their grandparents. They thank their professors. And if they have them yet, they thank their young families, uh, their unhugged spouses, their untickled children, and their unwalked dogs. <laughs> the dogs are always named, <laughs> and if possible, identified by breed. Naoko Aoki and Professors Dessler and Gallagher, please come forward. Naoko Aoki uh, wrote a dissertation entitled The Domestic Politics of Implementation, a Case Study of U.S. Denuclearization Agreements with North Korea, how timely. Uh, her committee was co-chaired by Professors Mac Dessler and Nancy Gallagher. Nauco's dissertation studied implementation of the 1994 agreed framework and six-party talks and found that the United States moved away from full cooperation with North Korea. That's something you don't hear about all the time. 
not just because of the Kim regime's misbehavior, but also because of domestic American political pressures. In the coming year, Naoko will serve as a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at the RAND Corporation, one metro stop from the Pentagon. Professor Gallagher and Dessler will now award the doctoral hood. Sarah Dickerson and Dave Crocker, please come to the stage. Sarah wrote a dissertation entitled Psychological Well-Being and Health Gains in the Developing World, Evidence from Peru and Malawi. Um, Sarah's uh, dissertation committee was uh, chaired by Professor Graham, Carol Graham, who is attending her own son's graduation today. Uh, Professor David Crocker was on Sarah's committee. Uh, Sarah found that working in working in poor communities in South America and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Sarah studied the emotional well-being of mothers and tested its correlation with children's outcomes confirming an intuitively sensible association for all mothers out there and children. That takes care of most everybody. Um, this makes sense. But, but she then asked if maternal depression predicted a range of specific negative choices in adolescents in their children and found that it did. And went on to ask, if the, most, if the more effective management of mothers' mood disorders and chronic illnesses, and this, let me remind you, is in poor people in Peru and in Malawi, not in Montgomery County, right? Um, and went on to ask if more effective management of mothers' mood disorders and chronic illnesses, including AIDS, would reduce cat catastrophic spending and she found that it would. Sarah is now working with the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution. Uh, Professor Crocker, uh, please award the doctoral hood. Sally Abdel Moise Hassanain and Professor Joyce, please come forward. <laughs> Sally's dissertation committee was chaired by the aforementioned Professor Joyce. Her topic, her dissertation, she entitled Budgeting During Uncertainty budgeting and public spending in post-revolutionary Egypt. The budgeting liter literature generally presumes political stability because it's easier to write about stability than instability. Sally did not presume political stability. Instead, she studied budgeting during and after political instability, specifically Egypt's 2011 Arab Spring Revolution and its 2013 army coup d'etat overthrowing the Muslim Brotherhood. She analyzed the government's own internal financial records. How she got them is not entirely clear. <laughs> and, and interviewed many of the men, all men, no women, in the Ministry of Finance. She persisted and she survived, and so barely did the Egyptian economy. Professor Joyce will now award the doctoral hood.
George Leventhal and Christopher Foreman, please come forward. George uh, wrote a dissertation entitled The Stubborn Persistence of Homelessness. George asked if the 100,000 home, Homes Campaign, which enlisted 186 communities across the country between 2010 and 2014, if it, he asked if it significantly reduced chronic homelessness, finding uh, contrary to expectations that it did not. However, it did help communities better understand the inflow of persons into, the chronic, into chronic homelessness and encourage these same communities to establish evidence-based practices to keep people housed. George, as many Marylanders would know, is a member of the Montgomery County Council and a candidate for Montgomery County Executive. Now, we do not endorse George's candidacy, but we do endorse his dissertation <laughs> and um, congratulate him on his current and future successes. on George's committee. It was quite an adventure. Uh, all right, uh, just one final comment. Uh, Dr. Aoki, Dr. Dickerson, Dr. Abdul Moise Hassanayin, Dr. Leventhal, and Dr. Pardo, who could not be here because he had to attend a family emergency in California. We welcome you heartily into the company of scholars. Congratulations and well done to our newly minted doctors. Will the master's class of 2018 please rise and approach the stage. Candidates for the Master of Public Policy, Ahmad bin Abdullah. <clears throat> Abigail Whitney Allen. Elizabeth Jane Allison. Catherine Allred. <laughs> Stephanie Marie Arizaga. Christine Bogan Phillips. Swam Borjas. <laughs> Theodore Akil Carruthers. <laughs> Patrick Michael Cochran. Brenna Rose Cole. <laughs> Shannon Corrigan. <laughs> William Evan Creedon. <laughs> M 
Maria Victoria Corzell. Aiden Daniel. Marcella Bonetto de Campos. Munica Devagudi. Kelly Christine Dwyer. Caden Hal Fabby. Ellis Ann Field. Nolan Fine. Sarah Louise Foster. Nathan Glenn Frierson. Maria Paz Gomez. Wes L. Hansen. Brian P. Harrison. Rebecca Heemstra. Thomas Michael Jones. Chitra Kaliander. <laughs> Nina Kuadyu. <laughs> Sarah Christine Lackey. <laughs> Eric Larger. Taryn Levels. <laughs> Arine Paola Lewis. Nan Lean. Tao Yu Liu. Emily Jungwa Long. <laughs> William Andrew Moroz. <laughs> Chloe Elizabeth Mazone. <laughs> Leslie McNamara. Isaac Munene Nendereba. <laughs> Diane Neville. <laughs> Cleti Nori. <laughs> Aluwatobi Akpayemi. Louisa Olson. <laughs> Renuka Pai. <laughs> Nick.
Naya Michelle Patterson. Corrine Alexandra Paul. Rachel Yvette Powell. Andrea Victoria Prada Hernandez. Ashton Rafferty. Catherine Emily Rollin. Kelly Marie Roberts. Nicole Rodriguez Hernandez. Helen Ruth Rogers. Emily Sandis. Julia Michelle Schubel. Christopher Scott. <laughs> Connor Augustin Semmelsberger. Stone Eisenhower Shelf. Sai Sriram. Komala Sribasham. <laughs> Amog Srinivasan. <laughs> Gabriel John Stangle Reilly. <laughs> Kayla Steinberg. Delisha Thompson. <laughs> Peter Seamus Tobiasen. <laughs> Jeremy R. Waldron. <laughs> Christopher Tate Walkup. Sam Hunter Wallace. Adriana Marie Wolliver. Tian Shu. Wertha Zaman. Yuyun Jun. <laughs> Zili Jung. <laughs> Singyan Zhao. <laughs> Yuja Zhao. The candidates for the Master of Public Management are Salim Muhammad Curry, <laughs> Caitlin Dubois, <laughs> Shanika Jackson. Glenn Edward Lydane.
Grant McDonald. Raj Pandey. Angela Marie Sanders. Yevgen Zagudayev. Robert Reed. the candidates for the Master of Professional Studies in Public Administration, Anisha Simone Boucher. Okay, Anisha. <laughs> Lee Chow. Jean Wong. Congratulations to our newly minted master's class of 2018. And now, we will honor our inaugural class of the BA in Public Policy. Will the bachelor's class of 2018 please rise and approach the stage. I could not be more proud to say the candidates for the Bachelor of Arts in Public Policy degree are Proma Chadre. <laughs> Amanpreet Kaur. <laughs> Omari Christopher Lemmy. Catherine Brodigan Pasco. <laughs> Esther Lourdes Rodriguez. Cole Mason Zevka. Michael Diamante Sanchez. Malin Soterio Droz.
Jordan Malik Texera. Ida Milana Johannes. All right, let's hear it. <laughs> By tradition, there is one last step the graduates must take before they are truly alumni. Mr. Carruthers and Mr. Lemmy, will you please return to the stage to lead your peers in one last critical action? All right, so in spite of all of the hassles, it is finally time to turn our tassels. Not yet, hey, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Right. right to left, three, two, one. Three, two, one. Yeah! You did it. This concludes our formal commencement ceremony. Family and friends, please remain seated until the platform party and graduates have recessed. Graduates, after you recess, please move to the large staircase just outside so we can take pictures of your classes uh, by groupings. Uh, and then we will ask the faculty to join you for another photo. So just a little bit of patience, we can get our photos done. And then we would like to invite everyone to a reception to honor the graduates in the Grand Ballroom at the Adele Stamp Union. Uh, this is not far away. It's a fairly easy walk. But if you would prefer, we do have a bus that will pull up in front of this building that will take you to the Stamp Union. But it's uh, no more than a five-minute walk if you choose to walk. So, with this, we conclude the 2018 Commencement Ceremony of the School of Public Policy. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs>